presentation, which is a great development experience. So what I want is the name. And let's say, let's take the emoji. So as you can see here that I have received all the countries here. And this is the list of all the countries that I have. And according to the schema, according to the documentation, we have the name and the emoji, which are both of the string type. So is it possible that we could obtain or we could use these data types in our React application as well? Uh, yeah, we can. We can it using TypeScript. So uh, let's jump right into the React code. So uh, this is a sample application that I've created with Create React App, uh, the boilerplate generator for React. And I have used the TypeScript template. So there are a lot of templates available and we will work with the TypeScript template because we want all the great developer experience that we have and that is obtained due to using TypeScript. And of course, as React hooks have been launched already, so we will be using the latest and greatest React hooks. And I hope every one of you who has used React will love React hooks. So uh, let's move forward, diving into the code. So this is my main file. This is the entry point of our application. And all of these imports are generated by the boilerplate. I have just added two extra imports here. One is for the Apollo client. So the Apollo client is that will accept our URL, which is our GraphQL URL as we had seen here. So this one, it accepts this URL and Apollo provider. So Apollo provider is a wrapper. Consider it as a wrapper around our application. So if you may have used Redux or Mobex, you must have used a provider which wraps all your components and it gives you the state as well. So this is exactly the same way as we have. And in this, we have to pass the client that we create as the props. So uh, this is how we would pass our provider. And let's get started and let's look at the app component. So looking at the app component that we have. Yeah, so our app component is a simple component that I've created and it in turn accepts a country's component. So this is a country's component that I've created and right now it's empty. There's nothing inside that. So it's just a country's list. So this is what we are going to create right now in our application and we will be querying to this API that we have here in the same format and we will be displaying the list of countries. So let's get started. Now, uh, a point to note here that even if you are a beginner in React and GraphQL, this is very easy to learn because everything is provided in the form of documentation and uh, as we are using TypeScript, it is very easy to infer the types that we have from this application. So let me start by creating a query, the same query that we have here. Let me just copy that. So we create our query using the GraphQL tags and uh, now we would have to call that query. So there is a function which is given to us by Apollo React hooks, which is use query. So in use query, we have to pass the query that we have created. And in turn, we get three states for that. So first is the loading state. Then if the API returns any errors or if there is any problem while calling the API. And finally, we get our data. So these are the three things that we are concerned about that is returned by use query. So let us add the states for our loading and error.
and at last we will be able to use our country's data here so let me create a list for that and let me map so uh, the way that we are obtaining the response right now is that we have this data here and in that we have an array of countries that will contain our name and emoji so let's write that out uh, let me create a list item and I will pass the index as the key. And for now, let us display the country's name. So this part, let us run this. So let us start the React server. All right, so as you can see that we saw the loading state for a moment and we have the list of countries here. For brevity's sake, let me just limit it to 10 so that, yeah. So here we can see the list of the countries that we have. And now, as we can see that even though we have used TypeScript, we are not getting any code completion. So I don't know what is in the properties of country, what can be added, what can be removed. So this is where TypeScript comes into play and this is where our development experience gets better. So first we will look at how we can add the types manually and then we will look at how we can automate those. So for, for the countries list, let me add a type. And this type will be a list of countries. So for now, I just have two properties here, name and emoji. Now, as you can see here, use query accepts a parameter as shown by the documentation. So that first parameter that we have here is the type that our data object would contain. So let's pass a country's type that we have created here. All right, so TypeScript is not giving us any errors. But now, when I access the country object, I can see that I'm getting code completion as well as the property types for what I have specified. So this is where TypeScript helps us a lot. And so I can type the name and let's display the emoji as well. All right, that's great. So as you can see here that TypeScript provided us the types that we could use both for all our properties as well as if I would add something else here like name one, which obviously doesn't exist. So this would throw an error. If you were using JavaScript, I guess you would see an error here somewhere on the page or in the console stating that there is no such thing as name one. But with the help of TypeScript, we can get the type checking right into our code. But as we saw here, there are a couple of downsides to this approach. So first downside would be that what if I want to add another parameter here like code? which is given to us in the documentation here. So we have a code property. So if my query has an extra property here, then I would have to add the same properties in the types as well. Now, this is a lot of manual work, as we can see. And we would try, we would like to avoid this manual work. And we would like to some library or some package to assist us in creating these types for us automatically based on the schema of our GraphQL file. So the best library that would be possible with this is 
GraphQL code gen. So GraphQL code generator, as we have here, is this website that helps you generate your code directly from your GraphQL schema. So this is my schema that the backend developer has created for me. And this will help us generate all the types that we require while using TypeScript for our schema. So we do not have to manually create all these types, which I just type right now. So this is a really helpful library. As you can see here, so this is our schema and the output is generated here and these are the TypeScript types. So as you can see that this is my type user and the same exact type will be generated for us in TypeScript. So this is the power of GraphQL code gen, which helps you in your development experience as well as in maintaining your types. So for the sake of time, I have already installed these packages. So these are the four packages that we will need. So one is the CLI, which will be used to run our script. And the other two packages are for TypeScript that will be used in our project. And the last is for Apollo. So as we are using React hooks, you would require the React Apollo package as well from the GraphQL code gen package library. So we have to install all these four packages right here. The next step after installing would be creating a script, something like this. So GraphQL code gen is a CLI. It accepts a configuration file, a YAML file to be precise. And in that we have to specify what our types would be. So the next part and the final part would be configuring our YAML file. So let's take a look at the YAML file that I've created. So this is the code gen YAML file that you can find in the repository that I will be sharing later and also in the documentation as well, which is explained very well. Uh, so these are the properties that we have to give. So the main properties that we are viewing here is the schema. So this is the same as our API URL that we have here and that is what we passed in Apollo. So this is the same URL. And the next important part is documents. So GraphQL code gen looks for GraphQL files. So we have to write all our queries in a GraphQL file. So instead of specifying the query here in our TypeScript component, we will be specifying it in a separate GraphQL file. So documents is for that. So my folder will be inside source. GraphQL and these are all the GraphQL files that will be read by CodeGen. These are the plugins that we had installed and it is in our package.json as specified here. So these are the plugins that we will be using. And finally is our configuration. So as we are using React and we are using the latest version of React, so I will not use any higher order components, but I will be using hooks. So we have to set the property config of hooks to true. This will generate automatically the hooks for us and which we can directly use in our application. So let's get started. Uh, let me run this command that I have created for generating the schema. So let me run that for you. So as you can see here, it has generated something looking at the countries.graphql file. So in a countries.graphql file, I have copied the same query here, which was here and just pasted it here in a GraphQL file. So uh, what CodeGen does is that it detects all our GraphQL files that are specified in the YML. And then after running this command, generate schema, it will generate all the files that we have required in our generated folder. So let's have a look at what code gen has generated for us. And as you can see here, code gen has generated for us a GraphQL tag, Apollo React hooks, and all the types that we require for our API. So as you can see here that I have countries and countries contains all these fields for code, name, and so on. So these all are generated automatically in a TypeScript file. So how great is that? We do not have to write any code to maintain our types and any code for 
intelligence and code completion this is automatically generated by code j so all these types are here with all the queries that we have and this is the query that we have written fetch countries query that is in our graphql file so it has created a type for that as well and as you can see here that countries.graphql contains the name and emoji in the fetch countries query so the same is being generated here where we have the name or the emoji any one of those as the types and finally it has created a hook for us use fetch countries query so we directly have to use this hook to get our data and this is what we will do in our countries file so let me just replace this invocation here with use fetch countries query as you can see this is being imported here directly auto imported by typescript and my data remains the same there is no change at all so i can access the country values here with name and with emoji same so there is no difference at all and let us see the output and yes we have the same output as well so look at the amount of code that we have to remove that we are not going to write manually so we do not need to declare the types and we do not need to declare our queries so all of this is just in one file that we have that is the queries file and all of this is coming created by the library graphql code chain and we just use the hook that it exports to us by the generated file so this entire file is auto generated you don't have to edit this file directly just one command and it runs on its own so this is the command that we have in our package.json that is generate schema and it generated a query for us so this is how simple it is to work with the graphql api with react and typescript this increases or accelerates our development experience to a great extent we don't have to worry about what the client is going to what the backend server is going to send us and what we are going to expect from the client there is a, a clear way of separation that we can directly get the values and you feel so connected using this api that all the values all the data types that were specified by the api you're getting back the same data types so the same data types that you can use in typescript so i have created another command which is start with code gen so what this does is that it starts a react server as well and it also starts the generate schema in watch mode so let us run this one So as you can see here, we have the same output and GraphQL code gen is running in watch mode. So uh, let us make a change to our query. Let's say we want the currency of the country. Let's save that. And as you can see here that it has generated the outputs. So now uh, let us look at our country's API and let us see if we can get Yes, and there we have it. We have the extra value as currency in real time. So we didn't have to run our server at all. And we get the currencies as well. So this is how easy it is just by adding this library called GraphQL code chain with your React application. You can create a superb development experience for yourself and you can see that how accelerated you would feel by developing this without any problems like and you get the same type checking that you have with typescript it will suggest to you that you have the wrong values you have the wrong properties in real time so this is how you would get an accelerated development experience using graphql coaching and with react hooks so 
that was the main part of my talk. And I think I would hand it over to Pato right now. Anyone has any questions for Ryan? For um, for Ryan? Okay, we are gonna jump to our next speaker, um, Colby. Cool. Hey, everybody. Uh, let me get my screen up here. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Cool. Oh, no. I got to restart Zoom quick. The system preferences didn't kick in. Uh, just one minute. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Good? Cool. Cool. Hey, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to talk about maps, how you can build them, and the impact they can have on the world. So who am I? I'm Colby Fayok. I'm the one taking a bite out of the world there. Uh, I work on UX and the uh, front end side of things at Element 84. You can find me pretty much anywhere by Googling my name as I'm the only one in the world. So looking at this first slide, it's a screenshot of Google Maps in downtown Alexandria, which is Element 84's HQ. Uh, we're probably all pretty familiar with Google Maps or Apple Maps and the features they provide. Uh, like for instance, with this location, we can see things nearby or check out the pictures from the area and find some recommendations on what to do. This next screenshot is public transit directions from my apartment to work. So when I don't have a car, I can get a good idea of how long it's gonna to take to get into the metro. This screenshot shows the driving directions from my house to where I grew up when I wanna visit my family. It never actually takes under four hours to get there, so that's a little optimistic. And how many of you like to travel? I would imagine most of you, and as much as Many of us would prefer to be in another country every month. That's usually not feasible. So my wife likes to go around and take virtual vacations around the world, which is a little bit better for our budget. But Google Maps lets her easily travel, travel around and check things out. Like here, we're showing an overhead view of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The cool thing about this, though, is we can get a street view look and get a close-up look. Uh, we can get an idea of actually how huge the structure really is. When I was talking to her about this, she was in the middle of one of her journeys, and she wandered to a place called the Valley of Geysers, which is in Russia on the Kamchatka Peninsula. Turns out this geyser field has the second largest concentration of geysers in the world. The neat thing about this, though, is we can check out this kind of place, even if we'll never have the opportunity to actually go there. It's obviously not going to the real thing, but we're still able to get a good glimpse of the remote places all over the world. Hey, Colby, is, um, sorry for interrupting you, but you are showing your uh, presenter view. <laughs> okay, thank you for giving me the heads up. All right, is that a little bit better? Yes, that's perfect. Okay. All right, so where does all this data come from? 
first you have the obvious one, which is scientists and analysts. And it's, this is just kind of a stock photo I found on the GIS website. Uh, but they're constantly hard at work collecting and processing data. You also have technology. And thanks to the cars and the people who build the Google Maps Street View, we can get a close-up of the pyramids and a fun few Easter eggs along the way. Then we have satellites that produce a lot of the overhead imagery we see and the data they collect along with it. A good example of this is MODIS Terra. MODIS is a moderate resolution imaging spectro radiometer, which covers every point on Earth with, with its image sensors every one to two days. They collect large scale global dynamics like cloud coverage, ocean processes, and changes in the atmosphere. There's thousands of satellites like those flying over us right now. Some aren't even working, but many of them are still operational. A lot of them are collecting images and data about our planet, like this graphic is showing uh, from NASA, which published in September of last year. Uh, it's showing the state of the NASA Earth team's missions uh, from now until 2023. So as you can imagine, this is just NASA's and how many other of the commercial and other government satellites are out there. The cool thing about this, though, is not only do they give these tools to work with, we can also get a daily dose of view from above on Instagram. So at the top, you can see the International Space Station, which isn't necessarily a satellite, but it shows the Earth at night, uh, where the bottom is a daily overview showing a fascinating look at Lake Tron in Tanzania. Then on the right, you have a gorgeous look at the Andaman Sea from NASA Earth, which is on the border of Burma and Thailand. So switching back to the map for a second, uh, this is just another look at downtown Alexandria, but behind that, it's OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap, or OSM for short, is an open source project that allows mappers all over the world to contribute to a map of said world. So this means another source of the data is all of you, all of you fine people, and you know, with our powers combined, like Captain Planet. But millions of people, whether together as part of a community like the ones shown here, have maps on OSM. Uh, thousands of people work on this every single day. They're adding points of interest in drawing streets, helping not just countries like the United States understand more about what's there, um, but also third world countries all around the world. This is incredibly helpful from a humanitarian aid point perspective, where here we can see identified refugee camps from the, on the border of South Sudan and Ethiopia. So where am I going with all this? The point I'm trying to make here is that these maps are more than just driving directions. They're actually helping save the world. There's a ton of research going on in many different areas from climate change to agriculture. These maps are literally giving scientists tools they can make to make a difference in the world for people's lives. Some examples that you can find online are services like NASA's Worldview. Here you can see the tropical cyclone Udai, which is one of the worst cyclones on record to affect Africa and the Southern Hemisphere. Here, something a little bit more recent is uh, NASA's firm service, which shows you all the active fires all around, around the world. Now here is a cutout of the uh, Australian bushfires that you've probably been hearing on the news. Um, here we can see the number of active fires in each location, in those little uh, square, square pixels. Uh, but these kind of views help teams manage resources for determining how to help people in these scenarios. And it's not just NASA. There are a ton of well-known teams doing great work trying to help. USGS is helping to map out earthquakes, where USDA is monitoring food access. Uh, they are all working towards providing more information to people who can actually make a difference with that information, uh, which is directly translating to lives saved. Luckily, I'm here to tell you that it's not as bad as you probably think to get started with mapping. So I'm going to break it down a little bit. So for those who are unfamiliar, uh, mapping applications generally look like a Jamstack app. Uh, Jamstack sites are JavaScript APIs and markup. It's pretty much a static HTML website, uh, something that you probably have seen in the Space Jam website going back 10 years, but utilizing JavaScript in the browser to make any requests to your APIs that would provide dynamic data. So it's not necessarily a new idea, but the architecture has got a cool name, which comes with some cool references if you're familiar with MBA Jam. But mapping, mapping applications look like a standard Jamstack app. So where you have JavaScript that makes the actual app run, you have the APIs, which are more closely related to your imagery and the data that you're seeing on the map, uh, which all compiles down to your markup, which gets served to the person using the app. So let's start at the top of JavaScript. We're going to take a look at Leaflet, which is the most popular mapping library available. Here we can see a simple example of the map we get from Leaflet's homepage. The map itself is pretty basic, but on top of that, we have a simple marker, which has a pop-up that's going along with it. Uh, behind that, we're using OpenStreetMap, as I mentioned before, which is providing us our base map layer. 
So how do we get there? Believe it or not, the small snippet of code proves this map. So let's break this down a little bit. From the top, we create a map instance by passing an ID into the div we want to mount it on. Kind of similar to how you would expect to pass an ID into or to mount your React application uh, if you're doing it from scratch. But then we set the position up that we want the map to be centered on, which is our latitude and longitude, along with the zoom level, which is how close into the particular area you want to look at. Next, we describe the layer that we want on this map, which is called a tile layer. I'll explain a little bit more about tile layers in a second here, but uh, we add the URL of the endpoint for that layer and an attribution to give that service credit. So this will give us the base of the map, but how do we actually get that marker? This last snippet creates a marker instance where we again set our latitude and longitude position. Then we bind a pop-up to that with some simple text uh, to appear in the marker. Lastly, we throw open pop-up, which opens the pop-up in its place. And after all that, we have our map. So next, if you're anything like me, which I'm guessing you are because you're at this meetup, you like to build your applications in React. Uh, luckily, there's a library that takes Leaflet and builds out components to natively support building a map in React. Here we have an example that's shown on the React Leaflet homepage. If you notice, it's the same map that we saw before with just standard Leaflet, uh, but now it's built with React components. Breaking this down again, we have our map component wrapping everything, uh, which we set our coordinates and our zoom. Inside that, we have our tile layer component where we have our URL and attribution. And then we add our marker component, uh, which then we have nested our pop-up and the simple text to get through inside. And again, we have our basic map example. Cool, so getting to that point isn't too bad, but let's talk about the data that actually gets into the map. So when dealing like with maps, I like to think of a poorly drawn cake. The base map is the actual cake, then you have your overlays, which are your icing, and then some data that gets sprinkled over top. Your base map typically looks something like OpenStreetMap, as I've shown, and Modus Terra, uh, which you'll see. Then your overlays are usually something that is maybe some small sample of high-res imagery or a heat map or just something to visualize that you can put on top of that base map layer. On top of all that, you have your data, which can literally be anything such as active fires or evacuation zones. So digging into that a little bit further with your base map, this is essentially the map that you have that covers the entire globe. So it's gonna be the widely available uh, imagery at the bottom of your map. This will be your foundation. Map imagery layers are called tile layers, which are composed of a bunch of little small tiles that make up one large image. If you can see at the top here on the screen, uh, this is what an endpoint typically looks like where the mapping application will swap out a few different parameters to build the specific tile endpoint. So in this example, we have a date, we have a zoom level, and we have an X and Y axis. We can just as easily swap out an open street map uh, endpoint here. Uh, but the reason we want to break it up into these small tiles is if we try to load the entire imagery of the base map, you're talking about something that's possibly over one gigabyte in size. And realistically, uh, the person using the map is only going to use a fraction. So from a performance point of view, it's clear that we'd want to use the tiles. So overlays are very similar to your base map, but a lot of the time you don't have nearly as much imagery available, which is why they're called an overlay. This could be, again, if you have high resolution imagery for only a little section of the map, kind of like I'm showing here, or if you want to show the heat map. Now here's a heat map, heat map example where we're showing the population density on top of OpenStreetMap. Here you can see DC is in the middle uh, where you have Philly on the top right to kind of give you an idea of what you're looking at. Um, but this is more imagery we can find easily and free available at NASA. And then we generally have data, which can be really anything you want visualized with shapes on the map. So here we're adding individual points on the map to ide identify active fires, which is in the uh, campfire wildfires in California. But you can also use lines, circles, polygons, for instance. Uh, here we're showing a fire boundary for the same point of view as that last slide, where points might be helpful to see the active fires, seeing the boundary might be easy to comprehend for somebody to see an area of danger. The point here that I'm trying to make though, is there really aren't any requirements for data. So there's standard data formats, such as GeoJSON that Leaflet can readily interface with, but nothing particular about how you store and serve the data uh, from your backend. 
Now, some of the data is free, some of it's not. Fortunately, NASA makes a lot of this data publicly available. And then you have a few other uh, teams that make some open source, such as Digital Globe, which gives you limited access to some disaster data. We've been working with a lot with that lately. Um, I showed you a few of the NASA ones already, but the rest would be a premium product that you would typically have to pay for. Even though sometimes you get a, a nice freeze here with teams like Mapbox. So once you have your application built out, the last step is getting it compiled down and served to your browser. Compiling down the app is pretty much anything you would expect from a, an app that is Webpack based, uh, where you can create with your favorite tool, like uh, just a standard Webpack config or create React or create React app or Gatsby. Uh, when using one of these tools to build your app, it compiles down to a static site with HTML, JS, and CSS, as you would typically expect. So once you have a compiled version, you can serve it anywhere you like, uh, such as GCP, AWS, or Netlify, which I've grown pretty fond of lately. So what kind of things can we build with this? We've been working hard at E84 to try to work with first responders in disaster scenarios to come up with a really easy to use a, uh, UI, where they don't have to think hard to get the information they want from the map. So we call this film drop DR, where we can plug and play really any data source, uh, whether it's free or with partners, and we can provide an easy way to visualize that on the map. I think the, the goal here was to be able to provide a trainable interface within 15 minutes, as trying to have first responders understand more than that just creates more problems and more that you have to train on. But the hope here is that someone who wants to look at active fires or the boundaries, they don't have to fumble around with advanced settings to get here. Another feature we added to this is the ability to add data points. So imagine if somebody reported a missing person, they can easily add this data point to the map, sync it up to the cloud for others to see. And the cool thing about this is we can store it locally on the browser. So in the event that they don't actually have network connectivity, which depending on where, if you're in the middle of the forest, you may not have. Uh, so you can store that locally, then once you have your network connectivity, you can sync it back up to the cloud. On top of that, we want to provide the ability for people to collect the information, the in situ data and immediately make it available. So someone with a drone can map out their area, upload it to the computer, and sync it with their app to make it available as a new layer. The imagery is actually from a coworker of mine who flew his drone up over Lake Lansing in Michigan. Film drop actually gets a little bit more interesting on the data side, not to go down a rabbit hole as it's a different topic, but uh, we're building this to be able to serve this static application off of an AWS Snowball Edge, which is that gray box that you see the laptop sitting on. So it's essentially a cloud in the box uh, that somebody can take out into an area that doesn't really have much connectivity and give them extra processing power uh, while using that application. So what makes this impactful? Uh, the hope here is that we can get first responders information they need to be more productive and efficient in the field. Uh, that could directly equate to more lives saved in many scenarios. So realistically, imagine someone in an area without a cell service. They can fly a drone, upload that to the Snowball Edge, and process it to visualize it on a map. This can help show things like what areas are impacted by a fire that are no longer safe to go. Another thing I'm working on is an app with one of our customers in the commercial satellite space. Working closely with Capella Space to provide an easy way for scientists to look up and analyze the data that they've collected with their satellites. Uh, so here we made a basic search of San Francisco where we can see all the imagery that they have available at this time. Once you select one of those results from the search, you can get a closer look and actually overlay it on the map. This comes with a bucket of metadata that's useful generally for people who are more familiar with this type of uh, work and the data that comes along with it. If Capella doesn't already have the image, uh, imagery available that the scientist wants, we can provide an interface that lets them actually task the satellite in real time. So once Capel receives that request, they'll utilize the open and close date to actually capture imagery the next time their satellite passes over that area of interest. So again, what makes this impactful? Uh, we're providing a way for scientists to easily discover and analyze data from satellites. This gives them more tools and more information to make better decisions that could impact the people on this planet. Next, we have Santa. Yes, that's Santa. Of course, we can have a little fun with this too. And I know it's a little past the holidays, but uh, I created a demo utilizing Google Santa Tracker API. It's not an official API, but it's uh, one of the people working said that it's, it's gonna change. It's not officially available year to year, but I was still able to make it work for this holiday season. Uh, but this allows us to see Santa's route in his current location. This, their API is, as you would imagine, it would show that Santa's at back at the North Pole, so it'll still be able to show the different stops and the route that he took along the way. 
might be hard to see here, but this snippet is where we're actually reaching out to the Santa API. We're grabbing his route and then creating a bunch of shapes and markers that allow us to visualize that on the map. Part of the route payload also shows how many gifts were delivered. So you can see in the DC metro area, almost 7 billion gifts were delivered last year. And if you're curious or interested in getting your hands dirty with some of this code, uh, the source code is up on my GitHub, which I can post on my Twitter later, but that's not a hint to follow me or anything. And for the last time, what makes this impactful? Well, for me, this was just fun to build. I love the holidays, uh, but these types of things like Google's Santa Tracker uh, app make, brings a lot of joy to kids around the world and adults such as myself. Uh, this particular picture was sent to me by one of my coworkers who they're he took his daughter uh, showing the Santa tracker and she actually tried to view the source uh, tr to try to dig in a little bit more. So when I'm talking about we here, I really mean all of us. I want to drive the point home that any of us can do this. The tools we have to make that are made available uh, makes this accessible for anyone to build with. To help out for a little bit with that, I put a Gatsby starter together where we can very quickly spin up a mapping app with little fuss and immediately become productive. So just as an example, if you wanted to use that starter, uh, using the Gatsby CLI, you would create a new project with the git address. This grabs the project and installs the npm director, the npm dependencies. Then you run yarn or npm develop, which starts your local server, and you have your mapping app. Uh, the mapping app itself is simple. I've been trying to add features little by little, but it's really just a good foundation to get started with building a mapping app in React. Or even if you want to get involved from an actual mapping perspective, OpenStreetMap gives you tools to get that to get started. OpenStreetMap.org has a vast wiki and some good walkthroughs for how you can use their tools. This screenshot is showing the roads and locations of uh, the White House here in Washington, DC. You can be part of a huge community of mappers who are working every day to fix and keep these updated. So before I stop, I just want you all to think, how do you use maps? What features do you use every day that you never actually kind of thought of how do they work? Maybe the next time you go to create a landing page with a Google Maps widget, you'll think instead to maybe create your own with Leaflet. And that's it, thanks. Feel free to ask questions here or reach out to me after. Uh, happy to chat about React or mapping apps generally. Hey, thank you so much, Colby. That was great. Anyone has any questions? Well, I guess there's not any questions. So don't forget on February 6th, there's the next uh, um, React Meetup. And if you are interested in speaking, please reach, reach to us and um, we will coordinate with you for you to want to be able to speak. Thank you so much, everyone for joining.